Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, and I am ecstatic today that my guest is Lisa Moody, because as everyone uh, knows by watching television or reading journals or having Twitter feeds on their phone, uh, politics is something that we're living and breathing and will until November, Mm. early November. So Lisa teaches political science here at Middlesex. And I love it. I'm teaching American national government. And usually every other semester, I also teach state and local government. And I will tell you that there's no year like 2016 to teach either course. Um, Obviously, for American national government, what goes on every day between the presidential election and just the happenings in Washington, I almost don't need a textbook because the textbook can be found in any newspaper or listening to any radio station. Um, It's just fascinating, and I think the students are enjoying it, too. But everything that I teach, whether it's the three branches of government and checks and balances and the roles of each of the branches, it seems like every week something happens to make it real for the students that I can bring into the classroom. Last week was a Supreme Court nominee. You know, how we have the executive branch with the president, the judicial branch with the Supreme Court, and each has their role to play. And our founding fathers, which is how I start teaching my course, the Founding Fathers set it up so that no one branch got too strong. Each has their own silo, if you will, of responsibility. And the President's is to nominate somebody to the Supreme Court, and the Senate's, in particular, is to confirm or reject. And the going back and forth that we have seen in Washington over, is the President right to nominate somebody, and the Senate's not going to take action, Frankly, they're both doing what they should be doing under the Constitution. The gov- the president should nominate, and the Senate, they don't have to take it up if they don't want to. You may agree or disagree with why, the politics of it, but it's a perfect example to the students of separation of powers and the you know duties and responsibilities of each. And then for state and local government, wow, the budget crisis in Hartford every day offers five lessons that I could bring into the classroom. And sometimes, you know, when you, and no disrespect to any of the other sciences and courses at Middlesex, but government and politics, while it may seem, and as I say to my students, you probably come into this class saying, I hate politics. I don't want anything to do with it. It doesn't affect me. I don't want it to. Nothing affects them more. More than math and science and even English, though I would argue for English is a close second. It affects them every day of the week. In so many ways, the government and the politics that leads to government affects them, and they really need to pay attention. So this is is an exciting year to be someone instructing young people about the importance of government. So do you find your students in this term, compared to the last couple of years, Mm -hmm. a little more tuned in to politics? I think so, because I think the way I approach it, and I'm far from a stuffy professor, that... I think they appreciate the, I'd like to think the humor I bring to it, the, I put them at ease in terms of learning and try to make it real so it's not just, again, learning a definition in a textbook. I think they understand it. And I start the first day, one of the first things I say on the first day of class is, I know you hate politics and you hate officials, you think they're all corrupt. I said, but how many people drove here today? And they all raised their hand. And I said, well, everything about that is government. Government said you need to have a license and pass a test. Government says you have to have insurance. Government says that if you didn't stop at that stop sign, you're going to get pulled over by the police and given a ticket. If you needed to get gas on the way here, government decided how much your taxes are. And then I asked them how many are getting aid of some sort. Almost all the hands go up again. I said, that's government aid. I said, and this is a government building, by the way. This is government. So for those of you who say, I don't want anything to do with it, it's everything about you. Your life is immersed in right. it. That's and that's right. the first five minutes of class. Yeah. And then we go from there for the next few months. Uh, and well, you can just see their eyes like pop open when you say that. Like, oh, yeah, you're right. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is, <laughs> this is why college is so important. <laughs> it is important. Right. Well, we have to take a break. When we come back, we'll go right back into the political morass that we find ourselves <laughs> in these days. 
Well, welcome back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I am so happy to be talking to Lisa Moody, who, in the spirit of full disclosure, yeah. has a political past. Yes, I do. I, in many ways, elective office and working, I got my degree in political science my bachelor's and was one of the few people probably in the world who actually got to use her degree in politics. And I ran for local office. I was elected to the Vernon Town Council when I was 25 and did really, really well for six years and said, oh, that's enough. I've done it. So I did elected office myself. And then I went to work for the legislature and I worked there for 29 years, for 12 years in the legislature at the Capitol, the General Assembly, as we know it. And then somebody who was a state rep, who I knew through my work, decided she was going to run for lieutenant governor. She was asked to with John Rowland, and her name was Jody Rell. And she asked me to come work for her when she and John won in 1994. So I worked for her as her chief of staff for 10 years. And then John Rowland, unfortunately, decided that he would do things a little differently and a little uh, wrongly, and he had to resign from office before being impeached. And my boss became the governor. Jody Rell became only the second governor in the state's history. She was, I think, our, about 380 years old, the state is. She's only the second woman who was elected. The first, I think most people know, is Ella Grasso. And I became, still am, though it hasn't been that long, the first and only female gubernatorial chief of staff in the state's history, which I'm rather proud of. This sounds like a, the substance of a book that should it be written. It could be. Oh, you sound like Jonathan Daube and others who have <laughs> suggested that. Yeah. So and then after she left office, I left office with her. Um, I came to start teaching at Middlesex and just absolutely love it. Wasn't sure I could do it, but then I found that I really, really enjoy the students very much. Yeah, and your classes are yeah. amazing. I love I just, them. As a witness to them. Uh, let's talk about money in politics. Mm. I started by asking over the break, I was saying, mm. how can anyone afford to be in the state legislature? Mm. Well, things have changed greatly. Uh, one of the, I was saying when I started in 1982, uh, there's probably 200 staff people. That was all the four caucuses, House and Senate, Republican, Democrat, and nonpartisan staff. There is nonpartisan staff at the legislature who does budget issues called Office of Fiscal Analysis. The ones that actually write the bills, the attorneys who write the legislative language for bills, that is known as the Legislative Commissioner's Office and then Office of Legislative Research. That was in 1982, probably 200 total. Now there's at least five times that many. And the staff members make quite a good uh, income there. But the people who run for office really haven't seen a pay raise or an increase in numbers. They make about, probably average about 35000 that's for salary and for mileage. And it's hard to do. It's hard to live on that. Things changed in the 90s. There were a couple of young men who ran for office who were in their early 20s. And they ran and they won. And you also get very good health care, I will say, in addition to the, the low salary. You do get very good health benefits, the state plan. And um, the young men ran and won. And they were innately political. And they... It really started to change, I think, in the 90s, where everything was fought over. Um, Republicans didn't talk to Democrats anymore. Staff didn't talk to each other across the aisle. Previous to that, you might fight over, I would say, 10% of the legislation were partisan battles. The rest of the time, you reached agreement on it, on things, and people would go out after work. It was a different time period in the 80s. You'd go out after work for a beer or a glass of wine together, and you'd make fun of each other's, you know, foibles. And then in the 90s, when these political young men, and they were men, started coming and running and serving, they couldn't afford to lose their job, because that was their only income and their benefits. And everything became political. They started sending out press releases every day. And that's when people really lost respect, I think, for the institution of the legislature. And I think even today, I'm going to say that probably 30% people can agree on and 60 to 70% they fight over. That is a partisan, everything is partisan. And that's too bad, it really is too bad. So you've lost the human nature side of cooperation. It's becoming a lot like Washington in terms of dysfunction and everything being political. The second part in terms of money is running for office. And um, one of the things that Jody Rell did after she came into office as governor, part of what led John Rowland to his downfall was campaign finance and taking contributions 
from people he shouldn't have. Some said pay to play um, from state contractors. So she spearheaded with Democrats and Republicans, mostly Democrats, and she was a Republican governor, campaign finance reform in the state. And I'm still very proud of what we put a lot of work into that, in which we said, okay, we'll publicly finance campaigns. And at the time, we were only the second state behind Arizona to have public financing. So essentially, we will write the check for your campaign so you don't need to go looking for contributions. You have to get solicit a certain base of small contributions. Then we'll, it makes you eligible. But in, in exchange for that, we're no con. No contributions will be allowed from state contractors, none from lobbyists. You can't do ad books, which is another way of getting money from these people. What is an ad book? Uh, when you have a fundraiser, say you're having a cheese and wine and cheese for $25, you're not going to make a lot of money for the campaign at $25, particularly after you take out the cost. But what you do is you have an ad book. and You go to, say, a business person, and you get their logo or you get their um, business card, and you blow it up and you put it in a book, you just Xerox this book, and they have to pay you 200 or $500 for that ad. And they call them ad books. So you're really making the money off the ad books. And you're going to state contractors and contractors, and you're going to lobbyists. And that's who the lobbyists go out. They put their own ad in, but let's say they represent Coca-Cola. They get an ad from Coca-Cola as well. So we said, we'll do public financing, but we're getting rid of the bad stuff that goes along with it. And we finally passed that into law. And since then, unfortunately, under, and I will say under Governor Malloy, they have really hurt the spirit and the letter of our campaign finance law. First thing they said is, well, we really think under the Citizens United we can't bar lobbyist contributions, so we'll give them a limit. Secondly, we're kind of ignoring the state contractor prohibition, and we're going to change that. And they've done, every year, they've done something to undermine it. They still get the check for running a campaign from the state, but they also, so they got the good stuff and they're undermining the reform measures that went along with it. And I think that's a real problem. And you're going to see, and there's a court case right now involving the governor and uh, the lieutenant governor. They're being sued by the State Election Enforcement Commission. And it's, any day now we should get the results of that lawsuit. That essentially one of the reforms was you can't collect, again, you can't take money from contractors. Well, what Governor Malloy has been doing is he's collecting money from contractors but putting it in the Democratic Party under their so-called federal account. So he's saying, I'm collecting money, but it's not going to go to me because we can't do that, so I'm put under the federal account. And everybody knew they were still going to use some money somehow for him and his reelection. And in fact, right before the election, a flyer was put out that talked about the campaign in general, then on the backside it said vote for re-election for Malloy and Wyman. And a lot of people immediately went, oh, well, you just violated the law. It said you can't use it. And they're arguing, well, it's just really just a little part of it, the whole book that we mailed out, just a little bit. Others are saying you just violated the law. Right now it's up to a judge to figure that out. So, so I'm pleased with some of the reforms put in place. I'm displeased with the fact that they've gone backwards. So yeah. in this cycle, this year, in 2016, in mm -hmm. addition to the presidential election, mm -hmm. is it true that every legislator in Connecticut is up for re-election? Yes, we have uh, 36 members of the House, uh, Senate and 151 members of the House. Everyone is up for re-election. And if the state were to provide campaign finance funds to those 170 mm -hmm. or so people, mm -hmm. that must be a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but we haven't really appropriated the money. We take it from the sheets. That's how the program was begun. As cheats is a fancy legal term, basically for money you might have at a bank that you forget you have. Oh. And after a certain amount of time, and every year the treasurer puts out this big book, a newspaper, essentially book, for people who have money they forgot they had. And now, maybe I'm so cheap I could never leave even $10 at a bank. But there are some people, for whatever reason, they have money in account that they never access for like 10, 15, 20 years. After a certain amount of time, and I don't know what that is off the top of my head, uh, the, the bank will say to the state, we have this money, we've tried to contact this person, they've never touched it, and after a certain amount of time it will revert to the state, it'll go to the state. So every year we get mil tens of millions of dollars in what's called escheated money. 
And the state does do, the state treasurer will come out once a year saying, here's the list. If you don't claim it within 30 days or whatever the time period is, then we're going to hold on, we're going to keep it. And we've taken the money for a campaign financing form from that as cheat money. How do you spell as cheat? E S C H E A T. S cheat. S cheat, well, yeah. yeah. I've learned something yeah, else new yeah. today. Uh, we have to take another break, and when we come back, we'll talk some more about politics. Well, welcome back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, talking with Lisa Moody today. And mostly, I think we're talking about money and politics. So if we think about, in the national scale, is probably the best mm-hmm. example of it. The ecosystem of industries that grow up around legislators. Mm-hmm. So obviously, lobbyists are picking up a paycheck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ad companies are creating commercials and, and for television. Mm-hmm. Then they're buying time on the television. Mm-hmm. So it must be... a bazillion billion dollars in this in 2016 that you know we're spending on a national scale yeah. there's a lot of money to be made in politics by outside contractors by campaign you first you have to hire campaign staff then you need to have cam- a campaign office or offices so there's rent involved for landlords they're making money uh, there's a whole lot of money being made in terms of direct mail it's not as much as it used to be because everything's gone electronic but you still want to send those letters out asking for contributions. Uh, there's a l- lot of money being put into social media. You need to have the web gurus who know how to write the programs and get them posted. And almost everything nowadays is instantaneous between Instagram and Twitter and the like. Um, but the biggest chunk is definitely ads and consultants. And the way it works is that the, consult- the media consultant they're the ones who come up with the ads, who writes the ads, hires the people to come in with the cameras and the lights and all of that. And then when they go to make a buy, let's say it's a, a Hillary Clinton ad, and they want to do a $300,000 buy in Connecticut, which is a good amount of money in Connecticut. It's about half a minute in New York City. But in Connecticut, it's a, they'll do all the TV stations. So they'll place 300000 and they pick what shows they want them to be on, um, whether it's news at 6 o'clock or if they're going for women, they'll do the Oprah, you know, they would have done the Oprah show or The View or something. But where they make their money is they get like 5% of that, what, of the, what they place. They get about 5% of it. So they make really, really good money at the national level. So when you were doing campaign finance reform mm-hmm. in Connecticut, were you thinking you would reduce the overall amount of money that any one candidate would spend on being elected or reelected? That was part of it. The real focus, though, was where do they get their money from, and that's what we wanted to clean up. And we also wanted to level the playing field. We have seen in Connecticut in recent election cycles a lot of wealthy people running because they can afford, much like Donald Trump this cycle nationally, They can afford to run their own campaign, put their own money in. You basically can't prohibit under federal law the amount of money somebody contributes like that on their own for their own behalf, Um, like a Linda McMahon or Tom Foley. So um, they're allowed to contribute, spend their own money. But for other people, raising $10,000 is a lot of money. And especially if you're going to rely on $5, $10, $25 contributions, that takes a whole lot of money. At the national level, the most recent figures I saw that the typical average U.S. Senate race costs $10 million. That's what you needed to raise. And the typical House of Representatives race, Congress race, was $1.5 million. So if you think, where am I going to... That's every, I don't every know two anybody. years, not every six years. So, so it really the Senate's is $10 similar. million, but yeah. it's, you're right, it's every six years. So even here in Connecticut, at a local level, Probably a Senate race, $100,000 is what it would cost. There were some that were up to 200 and more, depending on how contested it was. And even for a House race, $50,000. If you think right now, okay, I'm going to run for the House. I don't know people who have that kind of money. And there are limits on how much they can give. At the state level, it used to be $250 per person. So if you divide 50000 by $250, that's a whole lot of people you got to find. So what we try to do with campaign finance reform is somebody who might be a really good elected official who couldn't raise money, that's going to encourage them to run. And in Connecticut, we have a very, and we have had, 
we're a very progressive liberal state. And the Democrats have controlled, other than really about four years, over the last 50 years they've controlled the state in terms of the General Assembly, the legislature. So we wanted to get some more contested races for Republicans as well. And it wasn't, not just the cities where the Democrats rule, but all over, suburbs as well, rural areas. Let's try to get more people to run for office. It would be good. So by saying we're going to take care of the side to finance, we were hoping we were hoping to draw, and we in fact we have we have drawn more people in, and we have come closer. The divide between the majority it used to be overwhelming, say seventy percent Democrats, thirty percent Republican in the House. There are some people right now saying that people are so angry in the state, not just at the federal level, but of the morass. I think was a term you used earlier, the fiscal morass, that we might see the first Republican majorities in the House and Senate in decades, and I think that is a real possibility. Generally, uh, one of the things I teach is that people say, let's throw the rascals out. Clean sweep, get rid of everybody. They're all crazy. And they say that, but then they say, well, you know what? My guy's not a rascal. My guy's a good guy. I know him. I see him at the grocery store. I know his kids. So if you say that, everybody's a rascal, get rid of him, but my rascal I'm keeping, then we end up keeping all the rascals. And the re-election rate for the Congress is about 90%. Oh, incumbents? For the Senate, it's about 87%. 86, 87. And the same is also true for legislative at the state level. So I think this year, I think people are of the mind, you know what, it's time for my rascal to go too. I really do think they're that angry and that unhappy with what's going on. So I think we could see it could be a truly dynamic election this year at the state and, and national level. Do you think that the issue of scrutiny of personal lives and, and you know, being exposed mm -hmm. is also another inhibitor for people to run? I mean, the money is obviously, you know, without money, yeah. they can't run. Right. But there is the chance that some, you know, misstep in right. one's past life right. would end up on the front page of the paper. Yeah, it, I do think it holds some people back. They're afraid, you know, what if they find out about this? Or I don't want them attacking my family. And we've seen that time and again where... The candidate do you leave alone, but they attack a family. Is my wife attractive enough? Or did my teenage son do something at 17 he shouldn't have done? That a lot of 17-year-olds do by virtue of their age and inexperience. And they're afraid of putting their family through that. Or they're afraid to have their family watch them get eviscerated as a candidate. It really has changed. On the, the press, I, I, I think we also need to have a re-examination of the press. Because the press, on one hand, will say, well, our job is to bring to the light, bring to the fore, the weaknesses of the personal characteristics of our candidates. And you know what? They're right. If you want to say about Bill Clinton before he won, it's the fact that he's going to cheat on his wife, an indicator that he would cheat on other things, or that it shows a weakness of his moral character. I think that's fair to say. But the press is looking, they're lurking behind every corner to try to catch somebody at something. And maybe it's not even anything, but the fact that they can put a headline out there, then it gives them a two weeks of stories. And people are like, why am I going to put myself through that to run? I think the press, frankly, is to blame for a lot of the dysfunction that we have and for making things more political. And for people, the game, the general game of gotcha, you know, at the, in politics. I think a lot needs to be reformed, the money side but also the press, and human weakness you can't guard against. I mean, some people are just bad people, and I do, I am a firm believer, having been spent many years up there, what goes around does come around, and eventually the people who deserve to be found out will be found out. But I just think it's too much a game of gotcha, and people aren't going to run. The people you want to run aren't going to run. But on the other hand, I can't say that scrutiny isn't a good thing, it's just how far do you go? And the people, our community, one of the things I teach, sadly, and everybody laughs because they know it's true. I said, you know the name of the president and his kids and his dogs, probably. Where does he stand on this? He's been in office seven years now. Where does he stand on climate? What five things does he really care about in terms of climate control or this or that? I said, or if I even asked you who the vice president was, you probably wouldn't know. And I asked my students at the beginning, 
I give them a test on the first day. I give them everybody a hundred. I don't tell them that at the time. I give everybody a hundred, but name your two U.S. senators. Name your governor, and I give them basic. Where was the first the Constitutional Convention held, and in what year? They're horrible. They don't know the. I, I if I gave them a real grade, it'd probably be a forty. They just don't know. But they do know about Kim Kardashian, and her sisters, and everything going on with Caitlyn Jenner. But they, they know that, and, and I think the press has brought us to that point, quite frankly, that that's what we're interested in, but we're not interested in the substance of it. I got agree. I couldn't agree more, and uh, and I think that the the Republican debates mm-hmm. where there were, especially when there was an under table mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. they referred to it yeah, as, yeah. Uh, and you know, ten people on the stage, yeah. and the, the, clearly the questions were phrased in a way to create spectacle right. because spectacle pays right. and exactly. the advertisers will pay more right. money to be on at those times. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and you're, you're seeing the current fight right now with Donald Trump and Megyn Kelly of Fox. Right. And as much as Fox is sitting there writing things saying, Donald, you're not being fair. You have a, I forgot what they wrote last week, an unnatural obsession with this woman. They love it. Fox loves it because as soon as there's going to be a debate and she's a moderator, people are going to watch just to see, what sparks fly. Exactly. So I I think both both politics and politicians and the media are to blame. Right. Well, we have to sadly bring this program to a close, but um, I hope you'll come back, as, as we, especially as we escalate into the, I'd love to. the November cycle of voting. Lisa Moody, it's so great to have you here today. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to all the listeners for being with us for this half-hour program. And if you want to find out more about Middlesex Community College, where Lisa teaches political science, where you can learn a whole lot more about political science, you can find us on the World Wide Web at mxcc.edu. This is Anna Wasesha wishing you a very good day.